The giant predator looked down, his muscles still tensed and braced for an impact that would never come. Each of his eyes independently darted around his adversary, only slowly deciphering what had happened only seconds prior. Another small figure had suddenly appeared. He was sure he had not seen them before. It was almost as if they had just manifested there. However they had done it, they had been quick enough to intercept the Miet's attack by pulling on one of their ears, causing the feline to yield with a face warped in pain. To see a deaf world predator be subdued so easily caught him off guard. Then again, it didn't seem like the Miet was even trying to resist in the slightest, instead just leaning their head back trying to avoid the pull on their ear. At first, Konglorch had thought that it was another Miat that had interrupted their fight, however a closer look showed that he had been mistaken. His four eyes narrowed in on the new arrival. The small figure stood taller than the feline by a slight bit and lacked any of the feline's identifying features. Instead, their body was wider and built more rigidly. They stood upright on two legs, just like the Miat did. However, a slight, constant sway immediately identified them as something else without mistake. Konglorch didn't know what a dancer was doing here, or why he had interfered with his fight. However, his presence was, indeed, a very pleasant surprise. What is your problem? The Mir said very agitatedly, whilst the newcomer had finally let go of them, rubbing their rear to alleviate the pain. I'm trying to keep you out of trouble, the dancer answered. A slight slurring in his voice indicated that he, too, was already fairly intoxicated by whatever had transpired previous to Konglorch's arrival. The alcoholic influence also accentuated the constant sway that gave the dancers their nickname amongst the Tomnostracites. The feline did not appear happy with that answer. I'm not the one making trouble here, the feline firmly answered. They probably wanted to elaborate on that further, however the dancer quickly stopped them. I know, I know, he said, while putting an arm around their shoulders and leaning into them closely. I know that guy started it, they always started. But he doesn't know what he's getting himself into. The dancer then used that sentence as a cue to loosen himself from the Miet again, as he stepped closer to Konglorch and looked up at him with an exasperated expression. Do you have a death wish or something? The dancer said, his annoyed tone slightly undercut by the clear inebriation audible in his voice. Konglorch looked down at the dancer, his eyes narrowing to nothing but slits. Slowly his mouth opened for an answer, revealing his long, sharp teeth to the tiny primate. His twin hearts now beat in a steady, excited rhythm, this night had just gotten so much better. Reprieve kept his head down. In the general, nervous jittering and chittering that had erupted in the bar, it was hard to try and make out what was happening. However, many of those who were closer to the altercation taking place had already started clearing the vicinity, with many of the surrounding people following suit. He couldn't blame them. Seeing the giant Tomnastracite staring down at two high class death welders wasn't exactly a picture that made him want to stick around either. However, it was a job, and he would fulfil it. But still, this wasn't good. Even though he could not hear what was being said, it was clear that the conversation was not a friendly one, and with a uh, Tomnastracite's arrogance, combined with the monster's volatile nature and the freak's sheer unpredictability, disaster was in the air. He should probably call this in. Usually his task was only to observe. However, the human was still a diplomat, as well as a target of interest for command. If he was going to get seriously injured here, that would be an instant way above Reprieve's pay grade. And if he was to just allow it to happen, he could definitely say goodbye to his position. Finally, when he saw the giant bear his monstrous teeth, it was all the incentive he needed. As secretive as possible, he leaned down and started to hastily operate his assistant, eager to report the incident and wait for orders as to what to do. He was so focused on his task that he completely took his eyes off the altercation if for only a moment. A moment was enough, however. His heart nearly stopped as an incredibly loud noise erupted from just in front of him. It sounded like something heavy hitting a metal surface, followed by the jangle of glass. His eyes shot up, yet Reprieve couldn't believe what they saw. With what must have been a painful impact if the sound it made was to be believed, the freak's body had impacted on the table, presumably after being thrown there by the Tornamstracite. Reprieve could feel every heartbeat reverberate through his entire body as he looked at the human, who seemed to lay motionless for a second. When Reprieve had already begun to think of the worst, the freak finally stirred. He pushed himself off the metal surface of the table and started to rub the shoulder he had landed on. Otherwise, it seemed like the impact it had sounded a lot scarier than it actually was. 
seemingly a bit dazed by what had just happened, or maybe just by the copious amounts of alcohol he had already consumed. The human looked around trying to orient himself, before his eyes finally landed on Reprieg. They made eye contact for a second, and Reprieg basically froze up as the freak seemed to ponder something. Oh, hi, the primate finally said, getting up on his feet and starting to stretch a bit, apparently not bothered at all about having been thrown across the room by the galactic community's largest predator. Didn't see you there, how's it going? Something about the shit indifference he showed was a lot more unnerving than aggression would have been. I... are you alright? Reprieve managed to bring out, while staring at the freak with wide eyes. He really wanted to sink under the table and try to get out of sight, however he could not. The human closed his eyes and twisted his neck, causing it to produce a sickening crackling sound that simply could not be healthy. Yeah, I'm fine, he answered. Finally dusting himself off and returning his focus back on his giant adversary, who was slowly walking over towards the table they were standing on. Now, if you'll excuse me, there's something I need to take care of. He turned completely towards the Tom Nemstra site, who had come to hold some paces away from the table. The human stared the giant down and crossed his arms. Then, without breaking eye contact, he lifted his right foot before bringing it back down onto the tabletop with great force, causing a sound similar to that of his body hitting the table. He repeated the motion multiple times, rhythmically stomping down on the table, filling the room with the drumming sound. Shortly after he had started, the giant joined in, also pounding the floor with the flat of the mauler of one of his massive frontal legs, while keeping his arms raised in a battle ready stance. The patrons of the bar didn't need any more hints than that and the bar was hastily evacuated by most, although a few bold spectators remained, anchored to the spectacle by their own curiosity. The fact that it was the human who started the beat of the drums confused Reprieg, however he didn't really get time to think about it, as the stomping slowly but surely died down. By now the adversaries had gained some space, with nobody wanted to stand in their way anymore. The only people that had been either bold or dumb enough to even stay close anymore were Reprieg himself and the human's posse. The monster especially seemed eager to stay close to the altercation, although she had taken the back seat since the freak had taken over for her. She eyed the exchange between the predators curiously while sitting on the nearest table with some strange object the freak had given to her earlier resting on her lap. The rest of the group, including the Abomination, had not left their places at the table although they were now once more joined by the medic, who had briefly left alongside the human earlier. All eyes were fixated on the seemingly uneven opponents. With the drumming of their feet dying down, the room was left in an eerie silence, pierced only by the claws of one of the monstrosized back legs impatiently scratching across the ground. While the two very different kinds of monsters were staring each other down, Reprieg looked at the human unsurely. His target was impressive, no doubt, but he was trying to square off against the biggest known sapient predator. The giant had him outmatched in size, mass and armour. The feet of all four of his legs were equipped with sharp claws. The frontal legs were massive and the feet were formed into massive, grasping maulers. Additionally, the hands on the end of his arms alone were the size of the human's head. And that wasn't even mentioning the natural armour covering the behemoth's skin in thick, intermittent plates the dagger-like teeth in his mouth with a long, muscular tail. Other than humans, Tornamstracites was certainly looking the part of a natural killing machine, and the odds seemed to be stacked against Reprieg's target. Then again, it was a death order the giant had to compete with, a title that his people, to their own admitted annoyance, could not claim for themselves. Finally, after what felt like an eternity of waiting, the first move was made, once again, it clearly showed why Rapik was chosen for the task of observing the target. While others stood awestruck and needed time to realise what had happened, his eyes always remained locked onto the human, even as he burst forward and off the table with blinding speed. Moving by leaps and bounds in an erratic zigzag, he closed in on his monstrous opponent without hesitation. The giant barely had time to react and was forced to defensively sweep in front of him with his ride mauler to stop the Primus advance. This strategy worked at first, causing the human to jump back from the swipe, however it also left the giant unstable on only three feet. The human, who seemed to be ready to pounce no matter what position he was in, immediately used this to his advantage, bursting forward again and hammering his fist against the thick plate, guarding his opponent's abdomen. The sound of the impact was audible for the room, and the focused impact caused the giant to let out a pain gasp. Yet the pain didn't seem to be enough to stop him, as he brought his mauler that was still in motion back around, swinging his backside towards the human's head. 
The human quickly raised his arms, blocking the swing. The giant's strength was no small thing, and the sheer force of the attack drove the human back a step, even if he otherwise didn't seem to be at all too affected by it. The freak now repositioned himself, meticulously staying just out of reach of the Tonabstracite's appendages at all times, only closing the gap whenever he got a safe chance to strike. The technique of avoiding being hit instead of trying to hit that Reprieg already knew of him seemed to be in full swing. The giant knew he could not move in for an attack, as the human's mobility outclassed his by a landslide. The dancer truly lived up to his name. Dodging each attack, Kongrog threw his way with swift, brief motions, often only avoiding being hit by a hair's width. However, while he seemed to only barely avoid the attacks on the surface, it was clear that he never even got close to getting hit in reality. He didn't need to avoid the attacks by much, he just needed to not get hit, and the precise movements allowed him to stay close enough to attack himself, even right after dodging. The dancer's tiny fists were like jackhammers, concentrating a great deal of force on a small area, and Kongloch could feel the hits even through his plates, as the impacts reverberated through his body. That wasn't enough to defeat him, but it was also clear that the dancer was not yet close to the limits of his abilities. The fight was entertaining, no doubt. However, if Kongloch wanted to show the dancer where his place was, he would have to change strategies. He paid attention to the dancer's movements. Standing on two legs and with nothing to keep their balance, these creatures possessed a great maneuverability and could change their position at a moment's notice with speeds and tonabstracite could only dream of. However, it also made them unstable on their feet, and they had to compensate for that. Even standing still, he constantly swayed in place, his feet and body always adjusting themselves to his centre of gravity, as it slightly shifted with each passing moment. The beings themselves weren't aware of their dance, but to a tonabstracite, it was a mesmerising sight, and what gave the small primates their name among his people. And sometimes this dance gave away a dancer's intention, even before they were quite aware of it themselves. The next time the dancer unknowingly leaned towards him, Kongloch flamed another swipe, and just as he had expected, the dancer reacted immediately, slightly shifting his weight around, effortlessly twirling around the pretend strike. Maybe it was inexperience, or maybe it was his clouded judgement, but he had become predictable. The same way he had done multiple times before, the dancer closed in for an attack as soon as Kongloch left himself open. However, this time he was ready for it. Since he couldn't react to his speed, he had to predict the moment the tiny competitor burst forward, blindly bringing his arms down and grasping, and he succeeded. He managed to grab onto his opponent, lifting him off his feet and restricting his arms between his own. Holding him in what could have been mistaken for a tight embrace, he pressed the fleshy bean against the hard plate, protecting his own thorax, slowly increasing the pressure. The dancer struggled. He managed to bring his hands between the plate and his own chest, and Kongloch could feel him trying to push out of his hold, but his tiny arms were strong enough to break out of a tenostracized grasp. The dancer's legs, his biggest advantage, uselessly dangled around in mid-air as he held him up. Nasty move, the dancer commented through strained breaths. He didn't sound pained yet, so it seemed he could handle the pressure so far. However, it remained to be seen how long that would be the case. A good fight. You certainly alleviated my boredom, Kongloch said, bringing his head close to the dancer's ear. If he had been prey, a quick bite to the head would have ended the hunt at this time. Now submit. You have proven to be a strong competitor. There is no shame in accepting one's place. The dancer let out a loud, gibbering sound, more than confirming his primate ancestry. I have a worse history behind me telling me that's not true, he said with strained amusement in his voice. A regrettable stance. However, the fight could not end as long as one of them didn't submit. Kongloch increased the pressure. It got to the point where even his own arms and chest started to hurt as he pressed down on the tiny creature. The strong pull of his homeworld had certainly hardened the dancer, but he could not resist forever. And finally, slowly, his legs stopped kicking the air as their muscles relaxed. Reprieg's finger was frozen just above the screen of his assistant. He should have called all this in a while ago already, but he had stupidly let himself get distracted. And now he hesitated once again. The human's movements had lessened and lessened in the giant's grasp. It appeared that it had been decided. And the human, for all his amazing abilities, still was not able to compete with something that had evolved to do little but fighting. In the end, he was still a primate, it seemed. A new sound ripped Reprieg from his thoughts. It was an impact. Something had once again collided with the Tenustra sight's plates. Looking up, it was hard to believe his eyes once again. The human, who had apparently found a new purpose in moving, had brought his legs up. They no longer uselessly padded through the air. 
Instead, his feet found perched on the divide between the thoracle and the abdominal plate of the being. And with the giant holding him upright, he could use the entire strength forced into his legs by evolution on a world with enormous gravity to push them into his adversary. Simultaneously, his arms also began pushing again. His hands pressed flat on his foe's thoracal plate. And just as his opponent had done before him, the freak started to put on the pressure. Rapri could see the dense muscles strain under his skin, yet he doubted that a human would be stronger than a giant, no matter how he struggled. Wondering what their reaction was, he risked a quick glance over the human's coterie. Most of them seemed just as shocked as he expected, seeing their alleged friend crushed like that. Of course, there was no emotion on the abomination's grotesque visage, as it emotionlessly looked at his comrade in peril. However, one of them fell out of line. The monster looked at the display with an expression of excitement on her face. It was strange. As much as Reprieg would have liked to claim otherwise, it wasn't really something he had come to expect of the feline, to get excited to see the freak hurt, even if the human was the only one to whom that statement applied. A thought crossed his mind. Of all the people in this room, she was most likely the only one who truly had a grasp on the freak's abilities. So could it be that she saw something that everyone else missed? The human already appears strong. Could he actually be a lot stronger than anyone could anticipate? It was a strained grunt from the Tonastra site that finally made things fall into place in his mind. What the human had done was a lot more than contesting with the Tonastra site's strength. In fact, that was the point. He had not just made a move. He had changed the game. He couldn't match his opponent's strength, but he also didn't have to. This wasn't a contest of strength anymore. By pushing it against the giant's grasp and combining the pressure they both exerted, it had instead turned into a test of endurance. With both of them pushing against each other, it wasn't about who could push harder anymore. It was about who could withstand more pressure. And apparently, the answer to that question was not quite cut and dry, as the strong material making up the tonastracized plates seemingly started to flex. The adversaries struggled against each other, their muscles tensing and their limbs shaking under the strain. Neither of them wanted to be the one to break first, but in the end, one had to. Defeatedly, the tonastracide had to release his grasp, the sudden disappearance of the force holding him in place caused the pressure still exerted by the human to catapult him away from the giant, who now wrapped his arms around the painful spot where the human's feet had dug into him. The human rolled off the impact and quickly got back to his feet, although it took him a moment to find his balance. This was the first time since the fight started that anything about his demeanour reminded Reprieve that the freak was, at that moment, not even in peak condition. Taking a moment to recompose himself, he took a few deep breaths and stretched his surely aching arms. However, his recovery was a lot faster than that of his opponent, so he was the one to make the first move again. Quickly closing the gap between the two of them, the freak dashed in, avoiding the half-baked counter-attacks his opponent threw at him with dancing steps. He ducked under a strike of the giant's right arm by merely leaning back. Then he avoided a follow-up swipe of the left mauler by quickly turning around his opponent on the other side of his body, past the still-raised arm. With the human now being out of reach of the biggest threats, this left the giant no choice but to try and turn, but he had no chance of doing so without the human effortlessly matching his movements. The size difference had become a detriment, as the human's tiny stature left him nearly untouchable where he stood now. And not only did the human know that, he apparently planned to take full advantage of it. Reprieve's eyes were firmly locked on the spectacle at this point. He was so taken by it that not even his nervous tick could manifest. His mouth merely hung wide open. Avoiding an ineffective slash from his opponent's hind leg, he waited for the opponent to sink down again. Once his claw had made firm contact with the ground once more, the human took his chance and used it as a stepping stone to jump on the giant's back. In what appeared to be a last ditch effort, the Tonastrosite whipped his tail up to strike the human. However, his opponent had thoroughly established that he could take the punishment at this point, and although the head definitely seemed painful, he powered right through it. Standing on the giant's long back, he was completely out of reach for any other attack the monstrous man could throw at him, so the Tonastrosite's next plan was to try and shake the primate. Wildly, he thrashed his body left to right, reared up and kicked out with his hind legs, all in an attempt to get his foot off of him. But the human held on tight, and his strong grip had no problem keeping him anchored to the giant's plates. And with so much mass to move around with his massive body, the Tonastrosite could not keep his wild attempts up for very long. Soon, his erratic movements got more sluggish, as he slowly started to lose the battle against gravity, a battle that his opponent didn't even seem to be fighting. The human had, quite literally, come out on top. Huffing and puffing, trying to get as much air into his lungs as he could, Konglodge felt the mass of the dancer climb over his back. 
For such a small creature, he was quite heavy, showing the density of his muscles and bones. He now felt a single hand placed softly on the back of his head, a place where he could neither reach nor defend himself. For a moment, he wondered if the dancer would actually be strong enough to end the battle, but he quickly admitted to himself that he was just pipe dreaming at this point. The tiny primate was as strong as being twice its size, and he had expended his energy. As much as he wished to think otherwise, ending this was nothing but a formality at this point, and he would rather avoid the unnecessary pain that would come with that. In hindsight, he had to confess, this had not been much of a fight. Do I have to keep going? The dancer asked, his voice still showing a certain unsteadiness. Konglorch let out a low bellow, reverberating through the room. No, dancer, it is enough, he answered for his hurt pride. I submit. Releasing a relieved breath, the dancer immediately took his hand off his head and jumped down from his back. Well, about time, the primate mumbled. He stumbled for a moment as he fell, but caught himself again quickly. Clambering and stomping sounded out, as the dancer's company got up from the table and rushed over towards him. James, are you okay? The old Raphaelite blurted out, leaning down to him and checking him over. I'm fine, the dancer groaned, but willingly let himself be inspected by the woman. Wait, what? Was that it already? The Miet commented, looking back and forth between the dancer and Conglodge. Their eyes still had that empty expression when they looked into his own. What do you mean was that it? Are you kidding? I don't know if I could take much more. And Uronek, he had not noticed earlier, said excitedly, staring at the feline with wide eyes. Then they turned to the dancer and added, although it was quite exciting to see you in action for once. The dancer tried to wave off their praise, but was hindered by the Raffli still trying to get a better look at the skin that had reddened where the few strikes Konglorch did manage to land had connected. Well, there would have been more action if he just used this, the Miet responded to the Uronyik, and walked over to the dancer, handing him the item he had given to them for safekeeping earlier. Clearly it must have been some kind of weapon. I wasn't trying to kill the guy, the dancer said, taking the item and fastening it to his pants. It was a good fight, and we followed all the traditions. It would have been a shame to spoil it with weapons. Konglorch blotted in, supporting the dancer's stance. You certainly are a great hunter. I can see why you challenged me at the Mia's place. You established a mighty place for yourself. He respectfully lowered his head to the tiny primate. However, the dancer just groaned. I don't care one bit about your weird honor fights, Lizator. I just didn't want to deal with the stress of either of you getting yourselves hurt he said annoyedly, while staring up at Konglorch. Seriously, don't challenge a fucking Miat to a fight. They don't swing that way and they will go for blood. You should know something like that. The dancer had taken on a scolding tone, strictly looking up into Konglorch's four eyes. Next to him, the Miat had a look on their face that left no doubts in the validity of the dancer's concern. You're lucky that I knew about your weird traditions or things could have gotten ugly, the primate added. Speaking of which, how did you know about those? A new voice injected itself into the conversation. It sounded weird, unnatural and mechanical like out of a bad speaker. Looking up with two of his eyes, Konglorch could see the remainders of the group. The Undyla and the strange black being also joined them. They had apparently taken a bit longer than the rest to get from the table to their current position. Gotta learn stuff like that if you're going to be considered a human ambassador, even if it is entitled alone, the dancer explained and finally managed to loosen himself from the concerned inspection of the Raphaelite. Lizardors will challenge humans at any chance they get, so you gotta know how to handle that, they told me. They're the only off-worlders we really interact with, after all. Our place compared to the dancers has not yet been established. Konglorch once again supported the dancers' words. It will take many fights to establish one, so many fights we will have. The dancer shook his head. How come the one species your people have relations with are Tanapsra sites of all people? Uronique inquired with a distrustful look at Konglorch. The dancer shrugged. Just kinda happened, he answered. They were the first off as we made contact with. Gave us quite the fright back then, scary as they looked. There are some recordings of it, and you should see the faces of... The dancer didn't get to finish his sentence, as the door suddenly opened again, and the room quickly filled with new arrivals. A security team had arrived at the perimeter, armed to their teeth. Certainly a bit late to the party. All right, you freaks, nobody move, one of them blurted out, as the squad leveled their weapons at them. This was going to be trouble. 
The security had arrived way too late to stop the fight, and now they were threatening to spur on another round of aggression. Luckily, at least the target and consul seemed to cooperate, raising their arms, and indicating compliance. It took the Tonustra sight a bit longer, as he defiantly stared at the security for a moment, but in the end he also complied. Calm down, this is a misunderstanding, really, the freak suddenly said loudly, and the inebriation that had been in his voice just moments earlier had seemingly vanished. I'm sure we can clear all of this up. Shut it! I don't want to hear a word out of you, one of the more eager members of the squad answered, threateningly thrusting his weapon in the human's direction, who seemed to be not at all impressed by the display. Smirking, the monster sank her head down and let out a single amused breath as she smugly stated, I don't think you should be talking to the ambassador like that. Reprieg wasn't quite sure how drunk the target actually was by now. However, apparently the alcohol didn't prevent him from immediately catching on to what she was doing and playing along. Well, it's going to be a fine mess clearing this up, he stated resignedly, still completely ignoring the weapons trained at him. Luckily, I already have an appointment with the matriarch booked. I'm sure she'll understand my situation. If there was one thing Reprieg had to give to the freak, it was that his ability to completely lie while also telling the absolute truth was indeed impressive. Everything he said was factual. And yet it still was a complete fabrication. But a fabrication convincing enough to plant seeds of doubt inside of the guards. Wait, Ambassador? One of them asked him directly, while some of his team members suddenly whispered to each other. Even his previous adversary now looked at him with a clear sense of surprise. In the flesh, the freak answered, apparently still just rolling with it. James Orwin, diplomat for humanity, Earth and her people. It is nice to meet you, although it is regrettable that our respective occupations have brought us into such a disagreeable situation. Some of the guards exchanged very unsure glances with each other, and they were not the only one. Apparently not everyone in the freak's coterie was quite as skilled in lying on the fly, and so most of them looked just as confused as the guards were. It took some very sharp looks from the monster to keep them from blurting out with questions of their own. Finally, the bold run of the guards broke out of the general stupor and asked, You say your occupation brought you in this situation, Ambassador? How so? He clearly still wasn't completely buying their story, although considering the circumstances it was impressive that the primate had gotten them to listen to him at all. Well, you see, friend, the human started, sophisticatedly, and either he had now sobered up completely, or he was very good at playing sober. While I may not be directly assigned for human Tornastrocyte relations, I as a diplomat am also not allowed to sully them. They are our closest allies after all. So when I was confronted with the challenge of a Tornastrocyte, I regretfully could not deny it. Not even in my free time, and not even in such unfortunate circumstances. It would simply be too big of a breach of trust between our people. But like I said, the matriarch will surely be understanding of my circumstances when I talk to her later. He was really laying into his performance. Each inflection of his voice perfectly mimicked so undeeply bothered by his actions, but also certain that there were no others he could have taken. The guard, who had by now apparently established himself as the de facto leader of the squad, looked back and forth between the two very unequal opponents. The Tornastrocyte's battle-hungry nature surely was a no secret to a guard of the GCS. They most likely had their handful with the giant predators more than once, and surely the humans too were no strange sight to him by now yet he still seemed hesitant. Reprieg let out a deep sigh and got up from his position, closing in on the guards. He is telling the truth, he loudly proclaimed, causing the guards, who he knew had not yet noticed him, to quickly whirl around and focus on him. I can personally vouch for the ambassador. He couldn't quite believe what he was doing. In fact, doing it felt so wrong that he would most likely have trouble finding any rest for months to come. However, it was the most sensible course of action. Not only was what the freak said technically true, but it also had been very detrimental to his task should the human be put under arrest after such an incident. Reprieg knew fully well his superiors would be highly interested in what he had witnessed today. In the true capabilities of these death world primates, observed out close, he knew Hyphati certainly would be. And while reporting about today's happenings, he would much rather not also have to relate that his target was currently in confinement, awaiting a verdict on what would surely have become a massive diplomatic incident. That most likely would not be healthy to his career. And who are you? The wannabe leader of the team addressed him and annoyingly also raised his weapon towards him. What a pest. He would have to get his name later to get him written up. Warrant Officer Reprieg of the Galactic Communal Military. He introduced himself, merely producing his identification on his personal assistant, 
which quite quickly shut the guard up. Like I said, I can vouch for the Ambassador, and since he is a busy man and indeed has a meeting with the Leader Supreme herself, I think it would be better if he was not further bothered for trying to avoid a diplomatic incident between his people and their closest allies, don't you agree? The guards look between each other. Reprika also noted that the freak was giving him a quite confused expression. That much was to be expected, however there was something more in his eyes that he didn't quite manage to hide. Utter distrust. After that it still took some more convincing, however Reprika eventually managed to get the guards to agree to let the target off with a warning, after they had taken the entire group's information. His adversary however wasn't quite as lucky, despite the freak staunchly advocating for him. Spare your breath, Dancer. The giant finally said, bringing the humans round to a halt. I never expected any different outcome when I came here tonight. I will be fine. The humans stared up at him unbelievingly. Then his expression changed to a strange laugh. You are a strange creature, he answered with a shake of his head. Then the giant was taken away. The not quite leader of the squash took one last harsh look at the freak, being the last at turn and leave the bar, the door loudly closing behind him. Well, that was an experience, the Freak commented once he was sure that everyone was out of sight. Thanks for your help there, um, Reprieve was it? The Freak looked at him with bared teeth, showing off his grotesque sense of sociality. It was nothing, really, Reprieve replied, quite eager to get out of the situation now. It was bad enough that he had to basically reveal himself to his target, even if not directly. He really couldn't stay around to small talk now. It wasn't helping his nerves that the Freak... The monster and the abomination were all present and accounted for, as well as currently staring at him. If you'll excuse me now, I will be taking my leave. This has been quite enough excitement for me, he quickly said, and turned away from the group and also towards the door. I wish you good luck for your meeting with the Matriarch. From what I have heard, you are going to need it. Success to you. He heard the echo of success to you repeated back at him, but he did not take a look back while leaving. The Freak had taken down the Tornastra site. Not only that, but he had also done so while drunk, and while refusing to use a weapon clearly at his disposal. Maybe this whole operation wasn't quite as overblown as Rapika believed, until now. He would have to make sure his report would be swift and thorough, before it might be too late. <laughs>